So, the faith systems of the Greeks consisted partly of what we know quite comfortably as the, the pantheon, the famous Greek pantheon consisting of gods who are known as Olympic gods. 7th century, a breakthrough started happening. If they believe it is 7th century, it could have been earlier, 8th century BC. A breakthrough started happening in this faith system through what came to be known as the Orphic system of thought. Orphic after Orpheus. You can see that Orpheus was a person who is said to have migrated to Greece from Crete or rather via Crete on to Egypt. If you can visualize the map of the Mediterranean in that part which is called the Aegean, you find that between Greece and the archipelago and the mainland in North Africa of Egypt, there lies a largest kind of island called Crete, C R E T E. So, Crete was a usual line of travel for a lot of people who are either trading or looking to go to places when they moved from north of Egypt known as Ionia and then through Egypt, I am sorry the north of Greece through Ionia, then through Greece and through the islands and then to Crete and then to Egypt, North Africa and then all the way east up to Persia. That was the usual route in which people moved. So, Crete was a very important kind of you know stopover place for many of these people. It is believed that Orpheus was a person who came from Egypt. He certainly seemed to have acquired a lot of his knowledge of his belief system from Egypt, said to have stayed for a while in Crete and then moved into mainland Greece. Now, the Orphic system brought something which was totally unheard of in the religion of the Greeks. It brought in the idea of transmigration of souls. The idea which was propagated was that all beings and all human beings were endowed with souls which left the body at the time of the dying of the body and could re-enter another form, another body at a later stage. So, this transmigration theory was absolutely new and added to that was the belief that all human beings at the time of death, either they went into a land of comfort, heaven as it were and alternatively went through a period of great suffering, sometimes for short periods, but the soul could also suffer for a long period of time. It did not use the word hell, Orphic religion did not use the word hell, but it amounted to what later Christianity called it as hell. Anyway, so transmigration and then the idea of heaven and hell. And then the idea was also that, that all human beings were partly divine, partly non-divine. So, the whole purpose of human existence in the Orphic religion was to purify yourself and purify yourself and purify yourself till such time as you were only divine and the human, the mortal in you left. So, the Orphic religion had enormous presence of rituals in a manner in which Greek religion never had before that. All kinds of rituals dominated the Orphic religion as steps towards purification of the soul. Some very conservative forms of Orphic beliefs or you can say violent forms of Orphic beliefs 
believed that the finest ritual was to tear an animal apart while it was alive and eat it, it would purify you completely. I will explain this slightly later why this happened and how many of these Greek beliefs later found their versions in the Christian beliefs. So, this was Orphism and Orphism also had a theology. What is theology? We are all the time using the word theology. Hmm? Uh, is it knowledge about God? It is actually a study of the relationship of man and God, no? Is not that what theology is all about? You remove man from the reckoning, there is no theology in Christianity, because it is man, son of God, God, the Holy Spirit. So, the trinity and related as related to man is what theology is all about, no? Anyway, this is certainly what theology became after Christianity. And the theology of the Greeks of the Orphic type had the following belief. It believed that Zeus had a consort called Persephone and they had a child called Bacchus. And Bacchus was torn apart and eaten by a type of human beings called Titans. And when they did that, he became a martyr, but the titans ate everything of Bacchus except the heart. And there are different versions of what happened to the heart. One version said that Zeus himself ate the heart and then Bacchus was reborn out of the thigh of Zeus. The other version is that Zeus gave it to Semele another lady consort of his and she gave birth to a child which was the rebirth of Bacchus. So, in the theology, the martyrdom of Bacchus and his rebirth is what everybody tries to attain. The martyrdom of the frail human part of themselves and the liberation of the divine part of themselves is what all Bacchian rituals or Orphic cults were about. So, the rituals are all focused on how to purify yourself and the purificatory rituals aimed basically at getting rid of the human side, the baser side to you and refining the divine side to yourself, so that you became purely defined, divine. So, this whole business of tearing an animal apart and eating it as a ritual is symbolic of the way Bacchus himself was torn apart and eaten by the titans and in the process was reborn as a divine human being. So, you would be reborn by if you symbolically reenacted not of course, by eating your neighbor, but by eating maybe an animal. So, this was broadly the Orphic cult. There were some Orphic uh, cults which are very conservative in the sense that they did not believe in eating any form of meat through the through the year except on the days of certain kinds of ritual ceremonies when they would give up their non meat eating habits and would tear apart animals and eat it for that day. Now, there are three four things about this system of belief which strike me as interesting versions of belief elsewhere too. The idea of transmigration of souls is very ancient. It is it's to be found in the Zarathustrian religion, it is found in Hinduism, it is found in it is found in certain forms of Buddhism. Yeah, it is found in Buddhism, all forms of Buddhism. It is found in Confucianism, it is found in Taoism of certain varieties, not all Tao, but certain varieties. It is found in most of 
Judaism before they became Zionists. It was an early Christianity, but later given up as a bad idea, bad, bad publicity. So, transmigration was is a pretty old idea that there is a soul and which is distinct from the body, it inhabits the body and that it leaves the body and it can go to other bodies is something which is a very old idea in all religions, most religions. So, the Orphic religion had that. The Jewish religion was pantheistic, I am talking of Judaism around the same period as the Orphic cult was spreading in uh, Greece from Egypt. Would you know that there, is, there was a sizable population of uh, Jewry in Egypt at the time we are talking about 600, 700 BC, a huge Jewish population in Egypt at that time uh, who had fled from uh, a tyrannical ruler called Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so, there was a big Jewish population and it is believed that Orpheus himself must have interacted with them, but there is no trace of the Orphic belief in anything that the Jews said then or later, because most of the Jews later migrated to Palestine from Egypt, you know the big exodus mm, in Old Testament. So, that there was an idea of transmigration in the Jewish faith with their pantheistic belief almost till about a couple of hundred years before Jesus was born is well established. So, transmigration is a big old idea. The other idea is rebirth of the divine through an act of martyrdom. You find this echoed in different forms of Jewish faith. It certainly found its echo in the very birth and the rise of Christianity, the martyrdom of a great leader, a divine person and reborn, right, resurrected in Christianity, reborn as purely divine. So, this idea is, the idea of resurrection, not just through martyrdom, you, you find it repeating itself in various kinds of Hindu pantheon, Hindu mythology and so forth. Very often a person would perform penances in order that he might be born as this or that in the next birth, right. And the idea is that you move, you prefer to move into a more evolved birth the next time. So, transmigration, rebirth is very common in the Hindu faiths too. It is very common uh, as a method of prayer in certain forms of Buddhism which consider Buddha as an object of theism. This is the Mahayana Buddhism which is in China, uh, I am sorry Indochina, uh, Sri Lanka, Burma and so on and so forth, where Buddha is considered as an object of theistic worship and there, there is a prayer for re-emergence re of your life in a more evolved form in the next birth. This is a very big prayer. So, I am trying to put the Orphic cult in its place. The idea of transmigration, it is pretty big going back to other religions who date back that far back in time. Then the idea of uh, rebirth after a martyrdom in the story of Bacchus is again to be found in other parts of the world. So, which basically means that quite aside from what the older uh, pantheon of the Greeks was, this Orphism had immense appeal to people. It appealed to people because it disciplined the lives of people in particular ritual structures. It talked to them about, talked to them about the possibility of your evolution from a dirty being to something more divine and so on and so forth through purificatory rituals and the power of a priesthood which comes in very usefully in all these things. So, it became immensely popular. So, by the time these great thinkers 
were talking about things in uh, Greece, predominant section of the local population was subscribing to one form of Orphic cult or another. It is not that this Orphic cults did away with the pantheon. The Greeks always liked the number of gods and they did even then, but it kind of focused themselves on Bacchus and the theology of Bacchus very strongly and the, the ritual processes of Orphic cult took over their lives completely. This is an important thing uh, in the light of what was to come later in the lives of many thinkers. Okay, now, so these are the traditions of faith in Greece as we have seen. Then let us talk of the tradition of knowledge. Right. Let us talk of the tradition of knowledge, the empirical and speculative tradition. This is attributed by Burton Russell who writes about history of world philosophy. He attributes this part of thinking, this style of thinking not to the Greeks, but to the Ionians who are slightly in the northern part of Greece and also to uh, other Greeks settlements which were in mainland Italy. So, he says this kind of uh, speculative thinking, thinking about the world around in materialistic terms, not simply in totally faith terms, this was a practice in these places, whereas the southern Greece was influenced more and more by the Orphic cults and things and so on and so forth. So, whatever this was a different tradition and it had a strong influence. A lot of these people who were big time thinkers actually came from outside of the mainland Greece. Some of them had a strong Ionian influence in their backgrounds too. So, the first of these traditions we can talk about is the Milesian tradition rooting back to the town of Miletus. At least three of the seven great personalities as they came to be known in Greek thought came from the Milesian tradition. There were two or three common things in the Milesian tradition, which, which makes one suggest that probably this system of speculative knowledge, uh, speculative construction of knowledge, the empirical system of knowledge, all these things might have originated with the Milesian tradition. The Milesian thinkers believed for instance, that the prime elements in the planet were the elements such as fire, water, earth, air. In other words, they could reduce the known universe to basic elements and many of them were combining this knowledge or this speculation with the speculation that in every personality there is a certain amount of water element there is a certain amount of fire element, there is a certain amount of. So, different personalities would be a composition of different types of you know elements in them with different characteristics. Now, this was common to almost all Milesian thinkers and almost all Milesian thinkers also accepted the fact that there was a basic substance to all life to all universe. It was a basic substance in the sense that it was something immutable, it was the foundation of all other substances and it was infinite. It just lasted and lasted and lasted without any time bounds to its existence. So, this belief in the fact that everything has a basic substance which you cannot perhaps describe, which you cannot empirically experience, but which you cannot deny is a big part of Milesian tradition. And a lot of what people like Plato, Socrates before him and Pythagoras was saying goes back to this particular aspect of Milesian thinking. Mind you, this is a different thing than the faith systems like the Orphic cults and so forth, where they said there is a supreme being 
and uh, that is divine and uh, my job is to make myself as divine as possible, right. It is what might be called an anthropomorphism, is not it? Whereas, the Milesian tradition was not talking of any beings or persons. The Milesian tradition was talking about a the substance which was the, the, the undercurrent of all substances. They are speculating on the existence of one single explanation for life, for the existence of different forms of objects. They were trying to formulate that all chemistry on the planet, all physics on the planet, all life on the planet could be traced back to this one single substance. In other words, they were going into realms of speculative philosophy, very different from the religious beliefs of people like the Orphic cults. This we must understand, because specific speculative philosophy leads to construction of knowledge by the society in the sense in which we have seen it earlier, inquiry, speculation, verification and so forth. So, the Milesian tradition and its basic belief in the substance in my idea go into constitute the basis of what happened in Greece in the next 100 years. The Milesian tr tradition could be attributed to around 6th century BC and afterwards. The greatest of these thinkers was Thales or the oldest of these thinkers was Thales. Among other things Thales is his, the, his, the scientist in Thales is applauded significantly today because he successfully predicted the onset of an eclipse and it happened exactly as he had predicted it on the date and times in which he had predicted the occurrence of this eclipse. It was the first time anybody had done this. So, Thales is construed as a founding father of modern astronomy by some people, although there is no work from Thales about which we are aware which suggests that this would be the case. So, this was Thales' claim to fame as a early scientist. The Thales, Thales also brought in both geometry and trigonometry into Greece from Egypt where it was already well known. So, the foundations of modern mathematics in Greece which came from Pythagoras onwards could be attributed to Thales and his work in geometry and trigonometry too. Now, the other one of the three famous Milesian school people was Anaximander. Now, Anaximander emphasized very clearly that everything came from this primal substance and he said this primal substance, substance was not water it was not air, it was not fire, it was none of these because he said if you extinguish fire, the fire is extinguished. If you drain the water from a vessel and then boil it and it becomes air, it evaporates, there is no more water, but the primal substance, substance is not subject to any such treatment. The primal substance cannot be heated, boiled and made to evaporate, it cannot be made to you know change states, but not to cease to be. So, Anaximander disagreed with Thales who said water was perhaps the primal substance. Anaximander said no, water can change states. He was aware that water heated becomes a vapor and he says then how can water be the primal substance. So, Anaximander was probably the first one among the Greeks to argue that there was one primal substance which had nothing to do with any of the forms of water any of the forms of fire, forms of earth which people said to exist. So, these five elements could be significant, but they were not the primal substance. Now, Anaximander of course, is attributed with the idea of having speculated about the shape of the earth. Now, Anaximander is said to have argued that the shape of the earth was like a table top and like a disc too. In other words, he did not believe that the world was round as later Greeks proved, but he said it is a flat surface, but there was a circularity to it too. 
and most important Anaximander is supposed to have made the first map, he is the originator of cartography as a science. There were two very great Greeks who led to substantial advancement of knowledge in later times in Europe. One was the person who invented cartography and the other one was who invented the art of writing history, Herodotus. So, Herodotus wrote the history of the Persian wars and thereby gave history as a branch of knowledge its full credibility and Anaximander drew the first maps which were not probably to scale, but which had cartographic correctness. They knew, he knew where to put the mountains, where to put the waters, how to give a an approximation through a drawing of how to get from one place to another. So, this is one great contribution by Anaximander. And the last thing which Anaximander said, which again made him immensely popular is that the universe was a, a perpetual state of motion. Nothing was in its place ever, because there was no place for anything everything was in continuous motion, continuous movement. Now, in later times, this particular statement by Anaximander led to a whole new branch of uh, thought among the Greeks, who went into war or battle, intellectual battle with other Greeks, who took another side of Anaximander seriously, that everything is one single primal substance they became the Greek substantialists, even Plato, Aristotle, they were all substantialists. There were others like Heraclitus who believed, well, there is no such substance, everything is changing, everything is moving, everything is transforming. So, this, this also comes from Anaximander, from another side of Anaximander. So, it is very often stated that Anaximander is the founding father of a lot of thought which became sophisticated in later generation Greeks and a lot of thought which led to later day development of science in the western world. And the third person whom we have to consider seriously is Anaximenes. Anaximenes is considered the founding father of the whole Pythagorean tradition. The Pythagorean tradition is a tradition which became very important because of the following reasons. One, Pythagoras was a substantialist. He believed in the primal substance. He believed that the primal substance is all encompassing, it is infinite and so forth. But he thought there was a way of finding this thing. He thought there was a way of understanding this thing. So, there was a lot of speculative writing into which Pythagoras went in order to unravel this primal substance and a lot of Pythagorean mathematics was an attempt to unravel this primal substance. So, the Pythagorean tradition is said to be the first beginnings of the modern tradition in modern science, which believes that the universe is subject to certain immutable laws and the purpose of science is to discover these laws. I mean this is the belief which starts after Newton, but you can see that this belief goes back as far back as the early Milesian school and more importantly to the Pythagorean tradition which formalizes this. Now, I will not go into great details about other thinkers partly because you have studied them, but other reason why I am not going into other details is the purpose in this class is not to introduce you to Greek thought either. The purpose was to understand that there is a way in which knowledge comes into being. There is a way in which society constructs knowledge and there is a set of forces which are structure, there is a set of forces which are communitas, 
the forces of communitas directly correspond to experience, the forces of structure directly com com correspond to faith. Now, my purpose was to show that in the early Greek world too, there were both these traditions. There was this tradition of faith and then I have briefly given you a glimpse of the tradition of communitas. Do you have any questions on this? Would somebody like to speculate a little on whether the world of Greeks as you have seen here has similarity to something else which you know from your studies, your knowledge? Does it ring a bell? Does it seem, oh, this happened somewhere else also kind of thing? No? Take a shot. I mean, the worst come to worst, you will say something wrong. Perfectly fine. It's like falling off a bike. Right. Good. Which only means that my question was totally woolly. So, I should ask it properly. See, the, the extensive faith system which the Greeks had also existed alongside the speculative and inquiring tradition which was also part of Greece. All I am trying to say is having once I said that this is what existed in Greece, does it look familiar that it existed elsewhere too? Huh? Ah, that is right. So, expand on it a bit. Yeah, under the Indian system also there were uh, the people who um, acquired and I mean, but like you were talking about the astronomy and uh, mathematics and all that existed and the sages also inquired into that and there was finally the process of faith and uh, whatever else. Right. Does that seem familiar? You see, the Vedic system was a system of incredibly complex rituals. In fact, uh, most of Yajurvedam is Karmakandam, which means organization of rituals. Rigvedam, bit of ritual organization, but Yajurvedam, the second, the most extensive one which we know today. Most of it was on how to organize this yagam, this yajnam, this mantram, this slokam. So, it was very orphic in that sense. Although you did not have the orphic theology here, once again you had the idea of sacrifice as strongly in this in the Vedic Hinduism as you find in the orphic cult. The idea of transmigration is very strongly prevalent in Vedic Hinduism and the performance of rituals is a way to transmigrate to a better life, is not it? And parallelly, there existed an incredible speculative stream, is not it? The whole lot of Upanishads were speculative in work. There is one particular Upanishad which I think has only 11 verses, the Mandiki Upanishad. It is only 11 couplets I think or 3 lines, no maximum 2 lines, 11 only, but incredibly profound in its depth obviously. Much, much later it became the source of the origin of a philosophy and debates around that philosophy had became the basis of inquiry into incredible variety of belief systems that existed in India at that time, but much later, much later around the 6th century AD I think, there was a man called Gaudapada. Have you heard of Gaudapada? Have you studied Gaudapada? You have heard of Gaudapada evidently. So, tell me about Gaudapada. We have just heard of him. Okay. Gaudapada 
is referred to by Adi Shankara as Paramacharya, that is he was his teacher's teacher. I think Shankara's teacher was Govindapada, if I am not mistaken, and who was a student of Gaudapada. We do not even know Gaudapada was his real name because Gauda is just Bengal, Gauda Desham is Bengal. So, Gaudapada might, might, might just mean a man from the Bengal or something. But anyway, Gaudapada wrote an absolute classic called the Mandukya Karika, which was significantly an attempt at an expose of the tiny Mandukya Upanishad, but in the process he ended up making a survey of all belief systems that existed at that time. So, this speculative leaven couplet speculative piece was later used by Gaudapada to make an inquiry into the 26 types of darshanas or belief systems which existed in his time. And one of the biggest darshanas which Gaudapada took up for analysis at that time was Buddhism. He took up Buddhism because at that time Buddhism was extensive and very popular among the masses. I am talking about the 6th century. And Gaudapada picks up one another great work on Buddhism and highlights it as this is what Buddhism is. This was by a great Buddhist preacher called Nagarjuna. Have you heard of Nagarjuna? He did not act in movies in those days. Then you heard of Nagarjuna? Well, Nagarjuna was probably the last of the great Buddhist scholars. What you know today as mainstreams of Buddhism, not the Mahayana versions you find in Bodhagaya or in Indochina or Ceylon or Burma, no, but the speculative versions which you find in Chan or Zen, that kind of Buddhism goes directly back to Nagarjuna, who wrote a book called Madhyamika Karika, about 2nd century AD I think. And it is stated by later scholars, today's scholars, philosophy scholars have big debate on this, that Gaudapada's Mandukya Karika was nothing but an attempt to revalidate Madhyamika Karika of Nagarjuna. In other words, there are many philosophy scholars who argue that Gaudapada was actually nothing other than a Buddhist himself. And there are a lot of followers of uh, Adi Shankara, the Advaitic scholars who say no, 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 no. Gaudapada was a very radical Hindu who thought almost like a Buddhist, but was not a Buddhist. But the long and short of it all is this, I am talking of the speculative tradition. Something gets written, God knows when, maybe 6000 BC or 2000 BC, 1000 BC, I do not know when these Mandika Karika and such other Upanishads were written. But something gets written at that time leads to an incredible bout of speculation almost a thousand years later and thinking in the hands of Gaudapada and from Gaudapada it goes to Adi Shankara. So, Adi, Adi Shankara's Brahma Sutram which is the his interpretation of the Upanishads you find is almost 100 percent Nagarjuna Karika and he attributes it to his Paramacharya that is to Gaudapada, which is the reason why a number of people believe that Shankara system itself is nothing but Buddhism with a few cosmetics. There is no such thing they say as Advaita, there is only a modified Buddhism which is modified by Shankara, which is the reason the other Acharyas like Madhvacharya and uh, Ramarja Acharya, not so much Ramanja, but Madhvacharya was mad with Shankara. You know, in Kannada, he had used some choices expletives to refer to Shankara because he was, you know, he said this man sold out to the Buddha. He called him Prachanda Bhavda. Now, why I am saying all these things is here is a parallel that you find to what was happening in Greece. A system with enormous faith in rituals and subsequent to uh, uh, sub subsequent to the Vedic Hinduism, you find the Puranic mythological Hinduism which grows with incredible speed 
48,000 gods and some more thousands of rituals oriented towards these 48,000 gods, right? And uh, there are uh, what is known as little Hinduism, big Hinduism. Big Hinduism is the one involving trans subcontinental gods like Rama, Krishna and all that. And the little Hinduism has zillions of small local gods, Elayaman, Nindaman, Nindaman, Muniswaran, you name it, you have everything, right? So, you have this huge systems of faith, a lot of it is Orphic and you have a tremendously active powerful line of speculation, which even at one point of time went into works very much like the Greeks into mathematics, into geometry, into speculations of nuclear nature and so forth. So, this is what I am trying to tell you that there is a parallel, there is a parallel which you find here. But what happened in Greece, which broke through into a realm of creating new ways of constructing knowledge in a society, it did not happen here. It did not happen here for one reason or another due to the different histories. The big break in the Indian subcontinent came with the increasing Islamic annexation of the subcontinent from about 1000 AD onwards. That was the beginning of a period when I think this classic syncretic Hindu systems lost confidence considerably. A lot of Hinduism went into hiding because for the first time in the history of the subcontinent, there was a belief system which was converting people into their beliefs through force of violence. Not not that there is anything wrong or right in this, but it is part of the Islamic faith that the whole world should believe and be believers only. Ya ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So, that was the aggressiveness with which Islam entered in this country around 1000 AD and that substantially changed the directions in which Hindu speculative thought, philosophical thought was going. It made the whole of Hindu religion introverted. The big difference you find for instance in the north is uh, the culture of big temples vanished in the north from around 10th, 11th century. Most temples were basically not very conspicuous, did not draw much attention to themselves. Whereas, in the south the older habits of big time temple construction per persevered right up to the 19th century, right up to the 20th century too, because in the south that kind of an Islamic cultural influence was not so profound. So, I am just trying to tell you here that history is a process through which a lot of things can happen. History is a process through which not just the structure and communitas in a given ge geographical terrain can operate, but it is a process through which a lot of external forces can also come into play in a system, in a relationship between a particular communitas and structure. So, we have the broad comparison. What we shall be doing from here on is to next week I shall give you a construction of the history of Christianity and the growth of church as a major social, economic and political institution in European history right up to the 13th and 14th century AD, beginning with the consolidation of the church, consolidation of Christianity as organized through churches in the 6th century right up to the 16th century when this church itself was facing, it, facing its own challenge from within its own structure. I look at the history of Christianity, the history of western world, what the society was like and how the kind of society that existed and how the kind of belief system that the church propagated mutually aided each other and enabled each other to grow till finally the speculative tradition was reborn in the west and how during this growth during what was known as the dark ages in Europe knowledge itself grew in a very limited form through what was known as scholastics. The scholastic approach to knowledge was the only permitted 
method approach. So, we will look at scholastics and what it did, what it could not do and so forth. By the time we have come to the end of scholastics, we have come to the modern period and we can reconstruct the history and look at the collapse of feudalism in the west, the rise of nation states which were transforming Europe, the tremendous revolution of commerce and trade which led to the rise of the cities and the merchant and trading class. So, that Europe is all set for a transformation and with the split in the church, with the reformation of Christianity, one last blow was struck for the rise of modernity. So, I shall take you on from there to the emergence of the thing called the age of enlightenment. How in all this process whole new world view developed, not about how to look at the world, how to understand the world. Almost in a very pristine sense, people in the age of enlightenment had the mindsets of old Greeks. They worked with much better tools, they constructed and created much better tools. For instance, Descartes was not only a great mathematician, you know Descartes is the founder of modern calculus. So, in many respects Newton owes a lot and lot of his physics to Descartes. So, Descartes not only had, he not only created calculus and linear algebra, he also was a great mathematician who, th who thought that you could logically prove the existence of God. So, Descartes was a very devout Catholic all the time had trouble. The structure communitas problem was very profound in Descartes. His experience was showed that the world could be seen more and more and more, it experienced more and more and more. But in him was this very powerful faith in which he was conditioned all through. So, this was and not only that in his lifetime, it was uh, extremely dangerous to talk anything about the world which did Christianity did not approve, church did not approve. So, Descartes had reasons to be afraid of himself and a bit afraid of the world around. So, as a result of which you find Descartes making very interesting speculations, logical speculations. We will do that when we we'll look into that when we come to Descartes. He was, spec he was creating very interesting logical speculations on why there should be a God. So, on the one hand the logic extends to such brilliant mathematics and then also creates this. So, this was the age of enlightenment, right. The age of enlightenment also produces brilliant thesis on the nature of human beings. A lot of we know as the foundations of modern psychology arise from the writings of people of that time. First time human being was thought of as a thinking person. So, how he thought, how the mind worked was very important for people of the age of enlightenment. And most important, the big movement in France which started called the encyclopedia movement. It was believed by the group of people who were constituting this movement that everything and anything on earth must be first classified, it must be discussed, analyzed, studied and distinguished from other things. In other words, the earliest ideas of creating an encyclopedia came up in France in the early part of 18th century and went right through the 18th century. In some, res some respects, we can say that the encyclopedia movement and the intellectual ferment it created lay at the heart of many things that happened towards the end of 18th century, finally leading to the very revolution in France. So, we look at that too. Then we look at what was happening in the other side of the channel in England and Scotland, other ideas are growing, the birth of great ideas of democracy. A lot of what exists in the United States today as a constitution goes back to the writings of John Locke. So, we we'll look at that, the world discovered not only this, it discovered a new way of politically living and by the 19th century, economics had advanced so significantly that we could see the world had learned to live economically also in great depth and great meaningfulness and productivity. Well, have a nice weekend.